Hi, Grandma here, and I'm reading Adam of the Road, and we're beginning the chapter Chan Jankin, uh, chapter 7. And uh, the picture here is of a um, minstrel. He looks a little angry or mean. I'm not sure. Um, and the dog. <clears throat> okay. And I, and I think Jankin probably is his name. One afternoon in late July, <clears throat> Adam and Hugh and Martin and Nick, of course, were lying stretched out in the sunlight on the wharf. They had been on the river in the little wherry that belonged to the house, and now they were resting and eating some walnuts that Hugh had got from Lady Rashinda. Now, I don't know what a wherry is, but I'm not going to look it up. I'm pretty sure it's a boat of some kind, and I don't think it's very important to the story. They were pretty old and rancid now, but the boys were hungry. As they cracked the nuts between two stones, they talked about the squires and which would become a knight first. Each boy had his favorite. Hughes was the squire of the stable, a breezy young man who shared his passion for horses and got him many a chance for a ride that he would not otherwise have had. Once he had taken Hugh to Smithfield Market when he went to buy a farm horse to bring supplies from the Delisle Manor to Essex. Adam's hero was still and always Simon Talbot, who was the carving squire. When the big saddles of mutton or sides of beef, the roast swans and peacocks and geese were brought into the hall at dinner and placed on the high table before Sir Edmund, it was Simon who carved them and distributed the portions. He carved with great skill and always looked particularly splendid when he was doing it. Then Simon loved music too and songs and tales. Simon had a pen case of his own and he wrote long poems to Emily on pieces of parchment which he kept under the straw in his bed and now and then showed to Adam. He was always in hopes that Adam would help him fit a tune to them but as Simon would not change a word he had written, there was a limit to what Adam could do with a tune, and they never had any great success. Simon is like the squire of low degree, said Adam. He quoted the opening words of the romance, which Roger sometimes told, but never at Delisle House. It was a squire of low degree, loved the king's daughter of Hungary. He loved her seven years before he told her of his love, and then he went away and fought in the wars for seven years to do her honor. And then, seven years, interrupted Hugh. What did the king's daughter do all that time? Well, she waited for him to come back. Oh, Emily won't wait any seven years for Simon, said Hugh with conviction. Even if she wanted to, Uncle wouldn't let her. Well, why not? Why should he let her marry a poor squire when she could have a rich and powerful knight like Sir Gervais? Uncle hasn't any sons and Emily is his heir. Adam had seen Sir Gervais de Warren, who visited <coughs> Delisle House with six squires and a band of archers in attendance and set the whole place by their ears. He was a burly red-faced man with a voice like a trumpet he wore fine bright clothes and when he turned round, his mantle swung out and swept everything off the table near it. Well, maybe she'd rather marry Simon, said Adam. Well, it doesn't matter what she'd rather do, said Hugh carelessly. She's only a girl. She's got to do what she's told. Adam found it all rather puzzling. Hugh and Godfrey and the rest pretended that Marjorie was their liege lady and set themselves to do their showiest feats of tilting and wrestling in her honor. The tales Roger told were full of the reverence and devotion that knights paid to fair ladies and the desperate dangers they met gladly in order to win a smile from the ladies or a favor to wear on their sleeves. But in real life, it seemed, a beautiful young lady like Emily was only a girl and it did not matter what she wanted because she had to do what she was told. It was strange, and what was more, thought Adam, he was very hard on Simon. He asked Roger about it that night when they went to bed on a bench in the hall. 
In the daytime, the hall was the center of all the life of the household. On the dais, at one end, was the high table where the Delisles and their guests ate, with their falcons sitting on perches on the wall behind and their dogs lying on the floor at their feet. In the center of the hall was the hearth, where on cold days a fire was lighted. Down the length of the hall on either side of the hearth, other tables made of wide oak boards on carved trestles were set up, and here the lesser folk who belonged to the household sat. After meals, the cloths were taken from the tables, the rich colored undercloth and the fine white linen overcloth. The boards were stacked against the wall, the trestles and benches pushed back, and there was room for minstrelsy and dancing, for games of chess and of dice, for talk and laughter. The ladies would withdraw to the room called the solar above, where they sat long hours over their embroidery, entertained by the gentlemen who came to gossip with them or the tales that Roger told. At night, on the benches against the wall or even in the rushes on the floor, slept some of the men of the household. The porters slept here, for instance, and the clerk of the kitchen, an archer or two, and Roger and Adam and Nick. Adam liked the great hall at night. The cool, fresh air off the river came in through the open windows and cleared the lingering smoke away. On moonlit nights, the moon shone in the embroidered wall hangings and woke faint colors in them. Adam felt safe with Roger close beside him and Nick pressing against him, and he slept deep with his coverlet over him and some rather musty cushions under him. Sometimes, of course, people snored, and that was less pleasant. On this night, after everybody had settled down into quiet lumps and, mu and mounds of darkness in the shadows, Adam whispered to Roger, is Emily going to marry Sir Gervais? How did you know? Is it common knowledge among the young fry? I guessed from something Hugh said. Yes, she is, said Roger. There will be a wedding soon and a big day for minstrels it will be too. After that, he stopped. After that, what? Adam prompted him. After that, you and I will go down the road again. Why? What would be Sir Edmund's minstrels anymore? Yes, we shall be his minstrels still, but he'll not need us all the time. We'll come back to him for holidays, for Christmas and Easter and Whitsuntide, but the rest of the time, we'll be off by ourselves. It's often done, Roger explained. Not many great lords keep their minstrels with them all through the year. Adam thought about that in silence. He remembered what Roger had said the day be they had left St. Albans, how long ago it seemed now. The road is home to the minstrel, even though he may happen to be sleeping in a castle. He would miss Hugh and Marjorie and the others as he missed Perkin, but he would see them again. So long as he had Roger and Nick, everything was all right. He began to feel sleepy. Nick got up and stepped over Adam, planting one foot deep in his stomach and the other on his thigh. Then he curled up in the little harbor between Adam's bent knees, gave a sigh, and went to sleep again. Adam slept too. The wedding took place in August. Never had Adam seen such crowds, so many great folks, so much good food, such gaiety, or such music and dancing. First, there was a ceremony at the little church of St. Clement Danes, just beyond the gates of the Delisle House. Part of that ceremony was performed outside at the church door, where the priest met them in his finest vestments, with a wonderful embroidered stole about his neck and part inside the church. After it was over, they all went back to Delisle House and the feast began. Emily and Sir Gervais sat under the canopy at the high table with the Delisles and De Warrens in all their glory stretching on both sides of them and Simon, very pale and handsome, standing before them, carving one magnificent roasted masterpiece after another. Now I'm gonna pause here their last name is, they didn't really have last names back then. <clears throat>
and they are called the Delisles because they are of the Lyle family. So their last name would really be Lyles, uh, but that is part of their nobility um, title. For instance, Marjorie's name would be Marjorie of the Lyles, Marjorie de Lyles. When people came to this country, the United States, they had to give up their uh, noble titles. So names like DE were dropped if they hadn't been dropped before. Interesting, Gervais is Sir Gervais of de Warrens. And I know a family with the last name of Warren, and they would be, they would have been at one time, their name would have been DE and then Warren. Uh, and the, the DE has been dropped, and so they are just now called the Warrens. But Warren is also a uh, Norman name. And then I happened to realize that the name of the book is Adam of the Road. So we're talking about Gervais of the Warrens, Marjorie of the Lyles, and Adam of the Road. Continuing with the wedding festivities. When Adam saw the rose peacock with its tail spread, he could scarcely believe his eyes, but everybody else took it calmly. The other squires were acting as ushers and seating the guests, and Hugh and Godfrey and Ralph in new surcoats with their hair washed and curled were attending with silver basins and ewers and fine white towels for people to wash their hands. <clears throat> Which brings me to another thought, and that is back then they didn't really have forks and knives. Well, they had knives, but they didn't use them to, well, they did use them to eat with, but uh, they would use them to cut meat. But they mostly ate with their hands, so their hands, hands got very greasy. And that's why Hugh and Godfrey and Ralph are going around with ewers or pitchers of water and basins and white towels just so that people can wash their hands. Between courses, the minstrels performed. Not only Roger and Adam, but a host of other minstrels who had come from near and far, attracted to a feast like flies to honey. There were minstrels with viols and harps and flutes and trumpets, psalteries and mere tabors. Now, I don't know what a psaltery or a tabor is, and, um, but I know it's a musical instrument. But I got curious and looked them up, and a psaltery is like a zither, which is a... Uh, well, it's, it's a stringed instrument played on your lap. The piano kind of replaced the instruments like the zither. And the tabor is a drum. Never had Adam heard such music. There was singing. Adam himself sang first with Roger and then alone. His voice soaring high and losing itself among the painted beams of the roof. The flush company sat silent for a moment or two while he sang. After dinner, spiced wine was brought, and comfits, and ginger, and nuts, and fruit, and there was dancing. For hours, the merriment went on. Some danced, some walked in the gardens, some listened to the minstrels. Roger told the tale that he had brought from France of the lovers, Ucassin and Nicolette, and Adam sang with him in the parts that were meant to be sung. Afterwards, Marjorie came dancing up to Roger with a gold brooch in her hand. Emily said that was the best tale she had ever heard and told me to give this to you, she said. It was a gold brooch shaped like quatrefoils, which is, looked a little bit like a four-leaf clover. They were building in the stone windows now. Roger pinned it at his throat where it gleamed against the rich purple of his cloak. At sunset, the guests began to go. The sun's rays lay slanted over fields and river and gleamed on the towers in the city of London. By groups in their bright clothes, the ladies and gentlemen were making their way across the fields and down the rutted roads toward their dwelling places, some on horseback, those who lived nearest on foot. The steward summoned all the minstrels to the small room of the hall where he did his business. They crowded together in the little space and he made them a speech. Sir Edmund is well pleased, he said with his affected lisp, with your performance. He desireth to reward you. 
To each of them in turn, he gave a purse, a small embroidered bag with a drawstring, heavy with silver pennies that clinked in an elegant way. Adam got one too, and he was proud enough to burst. He watched the other minstrels as they received their gifts. He had never seen so many of his craft together at once. One was old and had lost most of his teeth. One was young and handsome and gay, but cruel looking. One was tall and gaunt as a tree, but like a tree, he was straight and strong too. One was a little dark haired man with sharp black eyes and a thin, vivid face. His name was Jankin. And Adam liked him because he had smiled at Nick and leaned down to scratch behind his ears. There was one woman among the minstrels, Matil Makejoy. She was a rough, kindly sort of person who could dance on her hands better than she could tell a tale. Some of the minstrels went off at once toward London. Some lingered in groups talking about places they had been and people they knew and some gathered in a ring to throw dice, ready to risk the pennies they had just received. The dice box, it was said, everywhere was the ruin of the minstrel. <clears throat> in other words, they were gambling. Those minstrels stayed all night. The last thing Adam heard before he went to sleep and the first when he woke up next morning was the rattle of the dice box. Roger was in the midst of a very intense circle and would not leave to make to take a swim in the river with Adam. Feeling rather uneasy, the boy called to Nick and went off by himself. On the way back with his hair dripping in his eyes and Nick shaking a shower all over him, he met his father coming toward him. Even from a distance, Adam could tell that Roger was feeling gloomy. He walked heavily and his shoulders drooped. His chin was on his chest. His mouth was down at the corners and his brows were drawn almost together over his eyes. Have you still got your purse? He called to Adam. Yes, it's here in my wallet. Do you want it? No boy, I don't. Keep it close and don't let it out of your hands. Even if I ask you for it, don't give it to me. I'm not to be trusted with money. I lost mine at dice to Jankin. And remember, this is what Jankin looked like. And I could tell by the look in his eyes that he couldn't be trusted. Oh, exclaimed Adam, his face falling. All those silver pennies and nothing at all in exchange for them? <sighs> What's worse, trying to get the silver back, I lost Bayard. Bayard? Bayard? Adam fought the tears back. Oh, well, he told himself he never had a horse before. Oh, well, we've still got Nick. Say it, said Roger irritably. Say something. When at length it came, what Adam said made no sense at all to Roger. It will be pretty hard, said Adam, on Hugh. And if you recall, Hugh had a special relationship with Bayard and had hoped that Bayard would be his horse. Well, that's all for now, but I'm a little nervous about Roger. Roger was pictured before as being so perfect, and now we found out that he has a problem with gambling. Well, we'll find out more later. Bye-bye.